Amen. Let's go to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. And as you're turning there, I want to remind you that the word psalm in the Hebrew, mizmor, means a melody. It's coming from the root word meaning to strike or to strum an instrument. I was going to bring a guitar up here. I might borrow it, but I didn't want any of you to leave, so we won't do that. The Greek word means a, a poem sung um, to a stringed instrument. So just keep that in mind as we're reading through that these are songs. This is the songbook of Israel. A majority of it is written by David, as we know. We'll get to some other authors uh, as we move through it. <clears throat> we want to cover three psalms tonight. So let's just do that. Psalm 25, he starts out by saying, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Does anybody need a Bible, by the way? Forgive me. If you need one, raise your hand. Anybody? We're good? All right. All good. Okay. Sorry. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without us, without cause. Now, as we're reading through, and there's a lot to read, and as we're commenting or sharing, uh, always look for application in your life today. As David sings of God, as David sings of the Lord, we too sing of the Lord. We too sing, but we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we can turn it to the fact that we're serving God and, and we can apply it to our walk with the Lord. Here, David speaks of the most important aspect in our relationship with God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and that is trust. Circle that word, trust. Once we have determined to trust in the Lord, many of us have come to Christ, we've accepted Jesus Christ, we may even say we've trusted Christ, but then we're on that experience of really what does it mean to trust Jesus? And then he puts us through some trials and he puts us through some situations where we grow more and more in love with the Lord and more trustworthy of God. Trust is an important word. We can be assured that we will not be ashamed. We can be assured that we will not be disgraced, nor disappointed, nor will our enemies achieve success or triumph, as David said, over us. Even in the waiting, we will not be ashamed. Verse 4, he goes on to say, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my what? of my salvation. Yes, and on you I wait all the day. You've got to forgive me because I grew up in the 80s with the church and all these songs are just flowing through my mind. So I may have a little shed, a little tear here because we used to sing these songs in the worship service at Costa Mesa. David writes of a heart that has fully trusted God and what that looks like. What does it look like to trust totally upon the Lord? Well, he's there. He's humbly saying, he's saying, show me, God. Teach me, God. Lead me. And that should be a prayer of every believer today who trusts in God with their life. He says, be my revealer. Be my teacher. Be my leader. Be my shepherd, God. And I may depend on and I can depend on your ways. The word ways means the holy course of life. Your path, that's the holy way of living. Your truth, that's the divine instruction. That's sound doctrine. David doesn't seek direction or truth from man, nor does he check, uh, seek it out from the world's point of view, a worldly view, but God alone. Later on, Jesus, as you know, in John 14, 6, will tell us that he's the way, the truth, and the life, right? And he will even add to the fact that if you don't embrace me and trust me and go down my path, the way, the truth, then you'll never see God. I am the answer to all the questions that are asked, way, truth, and life. 
Verse 6 and 7, he says, Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness says, circle that, for they are from of old. Do not, he says, remember the sins of my youth, amen, nor my transgressions according to your mercy. Remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord, for your goodness sake. David asks three things of the Lord. He asks God three times here to remember. Remembering the mercy and the love of God that has shown, he has shown him in the past. And not to remember the sins of his youth. David wrote to Timothy and say, flee what? You all failed the test. Youthful lusts. Why would David, why would Peter, why would Paul Tell Timothy that. Because we all struggle with youthful lusts. If you don't believe so, then look how many marriages were ruined when Facebook came out. And how many of us decided to, or you, decided to uh, look up the old flame, right? And that old flame put up the picture from high school, you see? And then you have a rendezvous, that's what we call that, that, that sounds better. And find out, oh, what in the world? No, I'm joking. But it is true. Run from your youthful lust. And he's telling them, remember God. Remember these things. But don't remember the sins of my youth. That was not a petition for God to reward him for his sins, for his past sins and what he deserved. But according to what he needed, God's mercy. Mercy is not receiving what we what, what we deserve. David asked this based upon the Lord's attribute, his goodness. In verse 6 there, he writes of his loving kindness. I love how David wrote that. God's love is so great, he had to speak it in its plural tense. His loving kindness is this. Verse 8, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in the way. Amen? Amen. The humble he guides in his justice, and the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Amen? To such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your namesake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. He chooses. God chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. David now speaks of the man or woman who can have a relationship with God. The the humble person who knows he is a sinner, stands in awe or fear and respect of the Lord, who calls upon the Lord for pardoning. In need of a Savior who keeps his covenant and testimonies. His, His written word, the Bible, whose focus and priority is always towards the Lord who is his protector her protector, always on the Lord, not on what is surrounding them, not allowing the surrounding or the world to mold them, not conformed to the world, but transformed. He or she will dwell in prosperity, he says. And not necessarily riches on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but spiritual treasures of blessings and knowing we are king's kids. We are the beneficiary of God's riches in heaven. He given us a taste of that through our relationship with Jesus Christ. How he blesses us so. Verse 16, he says, Turn yourself to me 
and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look at my affliction and my pain. He goes on. He says, consider my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. There it is, that word again, my, my trust in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. David turned his curtain crisis it seemed that he felt isolated. Elijah felt that way. He was being afflicted. He was full of anguish, um, anxiety, distress, being surrounded by enemies who despised him. You know the story of David. We studied it. It seems that that, that was his whole life. And, and at this time, this crisis is going through, he petitions the Lord to allow his integrity and uprightness preserve him. In other words, remember my character, God, for I wait by faith and trust in you. Lord, remember me. Remember my character, how I act. No, David had problems, right? He had problems big time. And so do we. But he didn't want to be weighed, weighed out from his pro, with his problems. He's been forgiven. He's, he, he's been, he has confessed. He, he is a, a, a man like us. He's human. But he wants God to weigh him out by his character and help him out in his current crisis. And it's, again, only he that he can turn to. Verse 22, uh, Psalm 25 ends, and he says, Redeem Israel, O God, out of their troubles. And that's an interesting, I, I love David with this because it really teaches us, again, to focus on God, to focus on Christ. Yes, we can petition him, we can ask of him when we're in crisis to help us, God. Sometimes we'll say, where are you, God, you know? We know he's right there. But for David being a king, for David being a leader, for David being personally ordained by Samuel. Uh, he, he's not forgotten that, but he realizes as I'm in distress and I'm on the run or whatever, whatever situation is all, he's going through here, Israel will suffer, God. Israel's going to suffer. Notice he says, redeem Israel, O God, out of all their troubles. If they're harasser, harassing harassing me, if they're after me, and, and you know, if, if King Saul is, is the cause of David's, you know, distress and anguish, or his son, Absalom, he also knew Israel would be in trouble and neglected, and, and we saw that in both cases. The king was so fixated on getting David, let's get David, let's get David, and his son was so fix, fix, so <laughs> seeking after his dad's position, stealing it, taking it over. Israel suffered for it, and David knew that. I love this of David. God, it's just not about me. It's about Israel. If you help me, if you get me out of this, this pit that I'm in, Lord, my family won't suffer. God, God, see through with me. Help me, God, in this financial situation that I'm going through, God, because it does affect others. And for David, his heart was for Israel. His prayer was not just for himself, but for Israel. And he ends this psalm with a request for God to redeem them out of troubles, which leads us to Psalm 26. It's another psalm of David. He begins with, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have also trusted, there's that word again, trust. Seems like it's the theme tonight. I've also trusted in the Lord. I like that, I shall not slip. 
Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. Can we say that tonight? Can we go before the Lord and say, examine me, Lord? And can we accept what God will see? We already know. Can we accept the the report of what his examination of us will, will bring about? David continues in this psalm with a request for God to vindicate him, to ex- examine him, to prove him, and to try him. But David is confident in what God will find in assessing him, or we. Vindicate or judge me in order to prove my innocence, he cries out. For I'm one who walks in integrity and in honesty and uprightness. And again, I trust in God. And in doing so, he gives us a wonderful um, end result and blessing. I love what he says. He says, I shall not slip. Lord, if I'm constantly going before you, right? Last Psalm, um, my eyes are on God, focused on the Lord, constantly saying, examine God every morning, every day, Find, Lord, is there any sin in me? Is there, examine me. Well, then he says, that's the key. God will keep me from slipping. Examine me means to give me justice, defend my reputation. Prove me means, proving is the test of that examination. And when he says, try me, it is the results. The word means to smelt or refine as of gold of the heart, the man of God. And David wished the most thorough investigation be made of him. And he says, and I will not shrink from that examination because my feet will not slip. That's the kind of God we serve, friends. He will help us. But we have to be open. And by the way, he already knows what's in us. We try to hide these things and tuck these things in. Remember the last time we were in Psalm? I read that psalm, that song to you guys. There are dark places deep inside me. Lord, come in. (laughs) I'm tired of hiding these things from you. But he's just asking God to examine him. Verse three, he says, for your loving kindness is before my eyes and I have walked in your truth. I have not sat with adulterous mortals, I like that, nor will I go in with the hypocrites. Kind of sounds like Psalm 1, doesn't it? I have, I have hated the assembly of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. David tells of the results, tells us of the results for being vindicated by God, what God will know of his heart when he examines him. For God, I have kept myself, and I walk in integrity. These are the things that I keep myself from. This is the practical. These are the things, God, that I can do, I have done, to to stay holy before you, to be always prepared to be examined. Now, there may be things, and I'm sure there is things that David can improve on, right? But not in the flesh, but in the spirit, but in the strength Not in his own strength, I should say, but in the strength of God. He says, God, this is what you're going to find. He just wished for the most thorough investigation be made of him. He won't shrink from any test. He won't shrink. And and what he tells us here of the results and what, what God will come to know, although he already knows, man will see. Man will see on the outward. It's the vertical horizontal thing I love always to bring, right? God, as I will get vertical with you, I know in the horizontal, I will tell on myself. My heart will be open. My, my life will be an open book. Uh, it will speak of who I really am and that you are part of that and that, that you are part of who I am, who I walk. I will, I will not defile myself. I will, I will be a witness for the Lord because I serve you. He says, God, this is what you're going to find. 
this is the things that other people will see in me. Because each one of us is a sandwich board walking around. We all tell on ourselves who we are. Verse 6, he says, I will wash my hands in innocence. So I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. I, I just love the way he writes there. David speaks now as one who has cleaned his hands, a clean heart, a, a clean hands, pure heart, ha- having washed his hands in, uh, in innocence and the innocence and seeking repentance. And is able then to enter into fellowship with other believers. And I'm sure he missed that. When David was in Jerusalem, he loved to be among the people. He, he loved to go to tabernacle with them, if we can say it that way. He, he loved to go and worship God and serve God and, and, and just sing unto the Lord. As a matter of fact, he's writing these songs here. Many of these songs were written in times of isolation, missing, missing that, that time where he would gather to worship the Lord, proclaiming God's praise and the place where God's or the Lord's glory dwells. It's quite interesting, the writer of Hebrews would challenge us and warn us or encourage us in Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, as he says, let us consider one another in order to stir up. Remember we talked about that word stir up Sunday? To stir up the embers, to keep the fire going, to stir up the love and and good works. See, sometimes we think of coming to church, you know, as just, uh, uh, just coming, putting in your time and leaving. We know here that's not true. You know that. I'm speaking to the choir here, but it's important for us to be reminded that we can come to consider one another. We come to stir up love and good works amongst each other. He would go on, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. If we start to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, then we're not able to stir up love and good works. We're not able to consider one another. We're being selfish. Because people say, well, I don't need to come into a, a... a building with lights and sound, and I, I can worship God at home, and you can't. You can't. No one's telling you can't, okay? But how are you stirring up love and good works amongst one another? How are you considering one another, serving one another? If you are forsaking the assembling of ourselves or yourself together, and you're able to attend, and you're healthy enough to attend, that well, then you're missing out. Because God has given us gifts, right? He, he's blessed us. He's anointed us. He wants to use us. Amen. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. And it breaks my heart because as is the manner of some has been today highlighted and bolded because that's the practice of some. That's the practice of some. Again, they're missing out, and we're missing them. Amen? We're missing them. I have friends here in the local churches, pastor friends, you know. We just talk about that, how they're missing out, man. What he goes on to say again, but exhorting one another. That's ministry. Exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. The day is approaching. It's coming. It's coming fast and it's coming soon. We just don't know when. We don't know that day. We don't know the hour. But I guarantee you it's fastly approaching. One the Bible tells us so. One the, again, as we said Sunday, the, the evidence of the last days are among us. 
Verse 9, back to uh, Psalm 26. Do not gather my soul with sinners, nor my life with the bloodthirsty men, in whose hands is a is sinister scheme, and whose right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be merciful to me. And I like this. My foot stands in an even place. In the congregations, I will bless the Lord. I like that. David is pleading unto God not to gather him, if you would, with a, a sinful, but to redeem him unto him, himself by his mercy. Today, many want to live as sinners and die as saints. Isn't that sad? They want to live as sinners and die as saints, but that's not the path that God wants for us as believers. Bonhoeffer talked about cheap grace in the church and how detrimental it is. Bonhoeffer, imagine. He says, this is cheap grace, and it's bad for the church. It's not good. Here, David is pleading not to be gathered together with the sinful. Because there are still two places our living eternal souls can continue on. Hades or on to hell for the bloodthirsty, sinister, lost souls. In heaven, a place prepared by who? For us. Jesus, thank you. For the saints in Christ. Two places. See, people don't realize your soul's going to continue on. There's an everlasting life, both, in a sense, for the believer and the non-believer. But eventually, for the non-believer, whose soul goes on until the day of true judgment, when the flames of hell, the fire, the, the uh, lake of fire is now presented to them, and they are thrown into it. After that, we don't know. We don't know. But for us, we do know, for us who know the Lord, that we will continue on with him because we are his servants. He goes in verse 12, my foot stands in an even place. In the congregations, I will bless the Lord. David knew trusting and living for God that he stood on solid ground on a firm foundation. We just sang about that. Uh, it's kind of cool that, you know, Micah comes with these songs or, and they just fit the message. They just fit the scripture. They just fit the verses. And David knew in trusting the living God, my foot stands in an even place. In the congregations, I will bless the Lord. Again, if you're losing footing, if you're slipping, if, you know, we need to be, ask God to examine us and then come back into the congregation, come back into the fellowship, come back amongst the brethren who will, you know, pray with you and care for you and, 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 and uh, disciple or counsel you in the things that we need to know to keep us firmly on the even place. A firm foundation that encourages us and gives us more and more confidence and trust in the Lord. Christ is our solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against our house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. That's the NLT. It's built on the bedrock. Not on the sand, right? But on the bedrock. Let's move on. Psalm 27, last psalm for tonight. Psalm 27, verses 1 through 3, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? There's another song. <laughs> the Lord is the strength of my life. That's a couple of songs right there. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, just 
when we read this, just think how David is writing, where, where he's at, how he thinks. He says, when they eat up my flesh, to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumble and fell. Amen? Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. These are real things that happen, real events that happen to David. My heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this, he says, I will be confident. David gives to us why he can continue on in his life. And in what God, because of, of what God had I said earlier to have called him to be. Even in dark trials, don't raise your hand if you have ever been in a dark place. Have you ever been in a dark place? When the fear has gripped you, when, when you feel like you're becoming overcome by fear and darkness. But he says here, as I go through that, and he goes through it, the Lord is my light. But because why? Because he is my salvation. The Lord is his light. The Lord is his salvation. The Hebrew word for salvation means deliverance. That's what it means there. The Lord is my deliverance. Deliverance of this dark place. Deliverance of my enemies. We know that in New Testament, uh, that word for uh, salvation uh, means he is our redeemer. He saves us he, from sin. He saves us from condemnation, but yet those are our enemies. Our enemies today may not have skin on, but the, the enemy plays with our mind and says, you're condemned, bro. Look what you're doing, man. You're a sinner trying to live like a saint. The enemy comes at us. Our enemy is the sin and the condemnation that plagues us and tries these fiery darts to try to throw at us. The enemy throws at us to try to keep us active, keep us from gathering, keep us from serving one another. That's all he needs to do. Keep us from gathering and keep us from using our gift. Fine, you know, you'll go to heaven. That's all, you're out, but you're out of the game. Because I've invaded your mind. I'm paying rent in your heart and you're in your you're weak. No, oh, man, that's our enemy. And he has given us the salvation. He has given us the deliverance from that. Romans 14, 8, for if we live, we live for the to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Yeah. It's simple, man. It's very simple, isn't it? But if not, amen? But if not, I'm still serving the Lord, the three boys said. But if God doesn't keep us from being burned up like crispy critters in this fiery furnace, it's a win-win for us there, King. I'll be with the Lord. We'll be with the Lord. It was at that time where the Lord was with them, Right? There's four in the fire. In this, David says, I will be confident. Goes on to verses four through six. Um, <clears throat> one thing I have desired of the Lord. See, I almost sang it, see? That's okay. No. <laughs> Not today. No. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. I may dwell in the tabernacle of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And I like this. And now my head shall be lifted above my enemies all around me. 
Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes. Okay, thank you. I will sing praises to the Lord. That, that, that's just a, those are just some great verses, encouraging verses. The one thing that David desired, most of all things important to him, the one thing, the one thing he desired was to dwell, to dwell in the house of the Lord. Today, instead of us saying, I want to dwell, you want to, I want to dwell here at C.C. Fred with Pastor Mark. We're just going to live here and we're going to sleep on these chairs. And No, that's not fun. Today, the Holy Spirit dwells with us. How privileged are we, Christian, that the Holy Spirit, David just wanted, man, I just, I want this service to go on forever, God. I want, I want, I want you forever. I want to be with you. I want to seek your face. That's my desire. And truly, I think it's speaking both personally and application, but yes, where he goes, God goes. We know that. And he always wants to, Worship the Lord. But he says here to dwell in the tabernacle of the Lord, to behold his beauty all the days of his life, to inquire of the Lord, to know of him intimately. Boyce said it was not the earthly temple itself that charmed David, but rather the beauty of the Lord that was to be found at the temple, or we really was the tabernacle at that time, in a very special way. David found refuge at God's tabernacle. David found protection from his enemies, of which he will offer sacrifices and praise unto the Lord. And yet, in the times where he had to leave Jerusalem, he had to go uh, out of the protection of himself and, and, and of Israel, yet he could still sing of that. Sure, he, he is wanting to be there at Tabernacle, but again, God is always with him. But he does miss, miss that time of worship. Seven, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and he will. Have mercy also upon me and answer me, he will. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. I like that. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me. Underline that. There it is. We know he won't. Amen? He won't. Why? Because he's the God of my salvation. You're the God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsook me or forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. David has seen how God hid his face from King Saul, right? Remember that? Because of his rebellion against him, rebellion against his commands. He wasn't the king that he should have been, nor was he the servant, the the one who to serve God. And he saw that. We'll read later in 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 the 50th Psalms and around there that David said, take not thy what? Take not that Holy Spirit from me, God. Because I've seen David, I've seen King Saul without it. David is fleeing to God. Hear him and have mercy upon him that when he calls out to him, not for, don't forsake me, God. He continues to seek his face and he realizes that he will not leave him nor forsake him. David reminded himself that God is not like man nor even like earthly parents that may forsake their children. Have you been forsaken? Have you been forsaken? Have you ever been forsaken? Well, let me tell you, God will not forsake you. Loved ones may forsake us. Others may forsake. Friends may forsake us. We may have wounds from that. But God will never forsake us. He doesn't forsake his children. And I like this here because here it also teaches us that David is teachable or shares with us that David is teachable and humble and seeks for God's instruction. 
If you're going to be a leader, you better be teachable and you better be humble. Because if not, you'll learn the lesson of humility. Or humiliation, I should say. It's either humility or humiliation. It's being teachable, moldable, removing pride, and listening, and seeking in the Word of God, and seeking instruction. Moving on, verse 11 through 12, he goes and says, Teach me your way, O Lord. There it is. And lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Teach me, he says. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I could just, at that time, he's, the crescendo of the song, he's just, he's built up to that, you know. Don't lose heart. Don't take things in your own hands. Don't walk away, Rene, the old 60s song right now. Don't walk away. Don't backslide. Wait on the Lord. It will be the best thing we ever waited for of God's will. Wait. Wait on the Lord. Father, we thank you, God, for this time in your word. We ask, Lord, that we would take something we learned, Lord, beyond my notes, God, something from your precious